Yeah, my, my dog journey actually started, um, you know, I actually uh, started dog training about, uh, I guess it was about eight years ago. And, um, you know, originally, you know, I was kind of raised with academics and kind of encouraged to kind of move into that mold. And I was working for the Red Cross and, uh, you know, I, it wasn't that I didn't enjoy it. It just, it just wasn't me, you know, the office job kind of thing was just not me. And, uh, you know, people would say, you know, sometimes me, you know, Nicole, you should, you should be working with animals, you know, why aren't you working with animals? And everyone would kind of say that, but it just kind of wasn't really something that, you know, was in my family history and my background or was really encouraged. Um, now, once I decided to do it, my family was very supportive. Um, but yeah, so it was a little bit unnatural for me to kind of step out of there and go, oh, I'm going to be a dog trainer, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I got a I got a job. Actually, I was in PetSmart with my Labrador and I was uh, I was just playing around, showing him some tricks and stuff. And I, I didn't have any food on me. And I was just, you know, um, getting him to play around and you know, he was doing all this stuff like bow and you know bark and speak on command and back up and touch and all this you know waving his paw up in the air and and I guess the the lady that I was doing it for was um was actually the store manager and I guess she was looking for a dog trainer and she was really impressed that you know I didn't have any food on me and the dog was just kind of kind of playing around so I kind of got started there um and then from there I I got into you know you know more and more into you know eventually started my own company called the Packway Dog Training and uh really really kind of fell in love with the dog training and being able to help people and um you know seeing the changes in the dogs and working with all the different breeds and then I guess I kind of you know I was always raised with like you know I wasn't aware of some of these breeds for so long, you know, mm -hmm. like I wasn't aware, like I never heard of a Rhodesian Ridgeback, you know, I was really obsessed with German Shepherds growing up. Uh, and I still love my German Shepherds. I have one as well, but I, I wasn't really aware of, you know, you look at the dog book and I didn't see any of these dog breeds, you know, and, right. and, uh, you know, thanks to Facebook, as my friends will say, Facebook shows you the world, right? Yeah. So, um, so I kind of started getting in, um, I guess I kind of was looking, you know, looking around for breeds and, and originally it kind of started where I was looking at, I fell in love with a great Dane and it was a really awesome dog, but I kind of looked in and, and, and I thought this isn't the breed for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought there's just it's just I love those dogs, but, you know, they're called the heartbreak breed. Right. And they only live, you know, so and so long. Mm -hmm. So I got into kind of um, and I was looking at different breeds and I was like, is there any giant breed dog that can live long and all that? And then I got into the Kangles. And I was like, wow, it's really neat. And so I just kind of from there, I started kind of re realized that there was a whole world of dog that I wasn't really aware of. Right. Um, so I, I got into the and then I kind of I didn't even heard of a primitive breed. Like, what's that? You know, like yeah. it's kind of like, huh? You know, so I got in. I was looking at the Rhodesian Ridgebacks. And I was like, I really like the athletic dogs with a, with a lot of like abilities and stuff like that and working breeds. And, um, you know, I got in and I was looking around and I found the Thai Ridgebacks and right at the same time, I found the Fuquak Ridgeback. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of debating between the two of them. I really, really wanted them both. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> But I couldn't get the I couldn't get the v, it, the Fuquak Ridgeback is also called the Vietnamese Ridgeback, uh -huh. and I just had this feeling about them. I thought those dogs are like those dogs are something else, you know. Everything I'd read about them, but they were so rare and they were so hard to acquire that you know. And I I, I definitely wanted to have both of them, but my path kind of became to get the the Thai Ridgeback mm -hmm. instead at that time. So, um, I still, I love them both, as I said, but, um, but yeah, so I, I didn't, uh, you know, didn't know about these breeds and then, you know, basically I, I you know, and, and just by kind of a miracle, um, I happened to acquire a pair, um, this spring, um, really, really awesome dogs and just the, the primitive breeds are so, you know, they're so unique and there's something really different and like, they're just sort of fascinating dogs you know like their their nature's a little bit different than the regular dog um they have like 
they have a like a, they have the same sort of loyalty but it's kind of like you feel like they've given you their heart you know like it's kind of you got to kind of figure them out like they're a little different you know so that's kind of what got me kind of drawn into them was originally as a dog trainer being a little bit more fascinated by the mind of a dog as well as the abilities of a dog so i started to think you know these these primitive dogs operate a little bit differently they're a little more instinctual so in vietnam and thailand they often and many areas of asia they often don't breed out the instincts of a dog mm -hmm. so you have more of a more of the raw sort of dog um, I'm not sure if I'm talking too much here. No, 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 perfect. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, with these, with these primitive dogs, um, the line between the wolf and the domesticated dog is a little bit more blurred. So they're a little bit in between there, you know, they're a little bit more, you know, they're more instinctual. They haven't, all of their instincts haven't been bred out. Right. So, yeah. um, so they're they're not mixed with a lot of different breeds. They're they're more raw. Like the uh, Fukuok Ridgeback, you know, out in Vietnam was largely segregated to the Fukuok Island. Um, they don't really know a whole lot about the history, but it was there for, you know, it's been there for a very 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 long time. It's an ancient breed, and you know, basically, it kind of like domesticated itself alongside humans. So that's where they're a little bit different than the regular dog where you know that they weren't you know they weren't so much you know selected by breeding you know if you take even the rhodesian ridgeback it's bred by mixing you know various breeds of dogs all together kind of thing yeah. so it's a little more of a different breed for sure and what have you noticed like the difference between uh the vietnamese ridgeback and the thai ridgeback what have been some of the the differences well, understand that what I say, someone else might say something very different, mm -hmm. you know, simply because these breeds are extremely rare. Um, I've bred a litter of Thai Ridgeback, so I'm fairly familiar with them, but I haven't met a whole lot simply because, you know, I live in Canada and there's not a lot of them here. You know, mm -hmm. I've met a few. Um, and same, you know, with the Fuquag Ridgeback, largely I'm restricted to the two that I have, mm -hmm. um, just because they're like one of the world's rarest, most breeds. Like you pretty much have to go to Vietnam to get one, yeah. um, almost nearly. Um, now with the differences, I would say the primitive nature is similar. The, the, um, background and what they were bred for the hunting background, um, the um you know the primitive nature where they can be a little bit more feral a little bit more a little bit more needing to earn trust with people it just depends on the dogs and how you socialize them though like any other breed right, right. um but you're going to have your hunting instincts in both of them um good athletic abilities um you know they both have they're both highly well i wouldn't say highly related but they're both they're not sure which one came before the other but they both have kind of more of an instinctual mind instinctual way of thinking you know earning trust with humans that hunting background as well as um you know they were used a little bit for watchdogging and guard as well right right i would say from my perspective the big difference is that the fuquak ridgeback i feel is more primitive Mm -hmm. um could be it could be because mine are straight from vietnam but i feel that they're a little more um they also weren't socialized when i got them um but they are a little bit more um like i said they're a little more a little more of an escape artist mm -hmm. you know um the tie ridge back i find a little bit more subtle to be kind of you know in the yard versus your Fuquak Ridgeback might try to jump out and go hunting you know sort of thing right mm -hmm. um also the Fuquak Ridgeback I believe is used a lot more as a hunting dog in a pack and in a group so the mind of it is a little bit different versus the tie to my knowledge wasn't really used as a hunting dog in a group like you can go on YouTube mm -hmm. and the videos are predominantly um, 
uh, in Vietnamese, so it's, it's hard to watch them, but you'll see the Fukuok Ridgeback hunting, you know, they go out and they're, you know, someone takes them out hunting and they're all hunting together as a group. And I guess they're a little bit, it's going to sound a little funny, but I think there's a little bit of a similar nature with the Siberian Husky and the Fukuok Ridgeback mm -hmm. in that strong, beautiful pack nature. You know, where they are, you know, they, they do very, they do quite well in a pack environment. They like to kind of live around other dogs um, versus the Thai Ridgeback. I think, you know, they can live with other dogs as well. Um, but I think they prefer to live typically, you know, unaltered. I think they would prefer to live with, you know, maybe an, a, a different sex dog, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. I mean, it's always, it's always, it's always arbitrary, but in general, they're they're a highly highly devoted dog to the human handler, mm -hmm. and I think that they really excel in homes where they um, can bond extremely high with that with that family. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Fukuok Ridgeback is similar um, and has that same desire, but I think that they're more of a pack oriented dog mm -hmm. where they want to kind of. They're very happy being in a group of dogs and, you know, a little bit easier to socialize them for sure with other dogs. Right. And is the Fukuok, are, are they recognized by any, uh, like the FCI or? No, they're not. Yeah. Um, they're not recognized by the American Kennel Club, the FCI or the Canadian Kennel Club, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason why um, a lot of people haven't sought them out. Yeah. Um, to breed them in in these areas, um, they are they, they are registered in Vietnam, okay. but um, you know if you're looking to register puppies and stuff like that, you know that's a that's a difficult thing, right? Yeah. I'm still looking into that and seeing if there's a way that it might be possible through the FCI um, if if they'll recognize the Vietnam Kennel Club as a as a partner. It's possible, but uh, but it's it's a difficult thing, really. And a lot of Thai Ridgeback breeders have have said the same thing, feeling like they don't want to have to westernize the breed, yeah. you know, to fit into the Western world. Because mm -hmm. in the Western world, you know, we really want that highly, you know, highly domesticated dog that kind of fits in really easily into our lives, you mm -hmm. know, and. The Fukuok Ridgeback and the Thai Ridgeback is a little bit different, you know, where they they have a hunting instinct, so they might go hunting, you know. you got to be a little more, I mean, they love to be with you. They're very, very trainable dogs. Um, but, yeah, definitely, um, you know, feeling like, you know, that, um, you know, like not wanting to change the breed by making it have to be a certain way to fit into the dog shows is also, you know, a concern of mine as well, you know. Because they are, literally, to me, I think they're the most fascinating dog breed I have ever met. Mm -hmm. It depends. I mean, anywhere from, you know, usually about 30 to 45 pounds sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, around, around in there. They're, they're smaller than the Thai Ridgeback. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit longer legged and a little more, um, a little leaner. Uh -huh. So um, this tie is a little bit more stocky, a little more muscular. Mm -hmm. um, so Fukuok is about, oh, I can't remember my inches and measurements. I'm so sorry. No, you... But about a medium, medium sized dog. Mm -hmm. I should have, I should have studied that part. But a medium, about a, a medium, like I would say a small border coli or, uh -huh. or what I love to refer to as is coyote size uh -huh. more so, uh -huh. you know, so. That sort of thing, right? And what uh, what are some of the 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 modern jobs they have today? Is it strictly like hunting and 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 um, family protection, or is there other jobs that they have in Vietnam in that area? Largely, it's a little bit different. Like a lot of there's a huge passion. First of all, they're they're extremely rare. Or even in Vietnam, mm -hmm. they say there's like anywhere from like seven hundred to a thousand registered mm -hmm. Fukuok Ridgebacks, purebred registered ones. Mm -hmm. um, they're extremely rare. Um, if you go on the Fukuok Ridgeback Facebook page, you will see that the people take an enormous amount of pride in these dogs. Mm -hmm. They're very very proud of them. Um, they are used a lot in dog shows um as well as their you know they have breeding camps around vietnam um, i know that's kind of um what's the word debatable um 
Mm-hmm. You know, whether whether they should or not, but they do have breeding camps where they are trying to promote the breed uh, into the rest of the world. They didn't do as good of a job marketing the dog as the uh, as Thailand did. So they're quite a bit behind, um, but they're trying to catch up and get that dog out around the world. Um, what what jobs? Yeah, basically, you know, they're still using them as, you know, as a watch dogging. They're not a real guard dog to me at all. Mm-hmm. Like they're not. They're not some serious guard dog. I would say a alert dog, a watch dog, more than you know, uh, like a hardened kind of guard dog. Um, they can be. Just depends. I mean, once you socialize them. I mean, mine are really great with people coming in. Um, jobs they do, like I said, they do use them for hunting mm-hmm. for sure. Um, <clears throat> they um, now what's a little bit different is in in Vietnam they. Um, they don't have the same sort of economics that we do here. So um, the dogs are often fed rice um, and they're often not fed as well. And they will go out, you know, they'll, they'll feed the dog. And I'm not saying every one of them, but some of them are fed rice and, you know, not a lot, you know, and the dogs will go out and they'll go hunting and they'll, they'll catch their own meat right and they'll bring it back like they'll catch their own meat and like it's amazing they have that full ability like they are like i said they're to me they're in between a you know they have a little bit of a wild dog in them still Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um now in the western world where they will really um you know here once they become popular um agility um lure coursing fly ball you know right. maybe not so much fly ball but uh, agility lure coursing tracking um they are highly trainable you know they're that's the weird thing about them people think oh well, they're not trainable they are really trainable mm-hmm. they're really smart they're known actually in vietnam to listen very well to their owner's commands and they're very very smart um i would say rivaling any border collie for sure um, so yeah, so basically those would be the jobs that would be really great for, for this breed. And I'd love to see, you know, puppies that we breed here, you know, in North America go on into those type of jobs because I think the dog is so happy doing that. Right. right. Um, well, <laughs> it depends right now. My male, he wants a coat on him cause he's thinner coated, yeah. Congo's thinner coated. And so he's like, ah, what is this? And my female, she's like, ah, it doesn't matter. It's all right, you know? And so she's got a little bit more of a bushy coat. Uh-huh. So it's the same as my, my tie ridge backs where one is a more velvet coat, thinner coat, and the other one has a little bit of a more, a little bit longer. And, and like I said, it'll probably be one of those things where, you know, just depend on which one you get. But you just put a coat on them. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, you know, it's like, you know, they're – this isn't the time of year for them out here, but right. I mean, we still have like nine months, you know, eight months that are pretty, pretty good weather. Right. We're definitely going to want to coat them up during that time. And that's the only downside for them is that that, you know, but, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. um, they come in, um, like I have the brindle. Uh-huh. So I have the tiger, the tiger brindle. Uh huh. Um, most popular in Vietnam, considered the most, you know, um, expensive, I guess, is the black and the, and the brindle dogs. Okay. Um, black with like a black tongue or, or the brindle, the tiger brindle, which we have the tiger brindle. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, the markings are very striking. They look very much like very tiger like in the face. And I asked them actually if they bred them like that. And he said, you know, the, my expert told me that no, that well, that they that they actually originally came like that. They they actually had that coloring in them all along. Mm-hmm. Um, they have you know a tan or kind of cream colored, and a um, <clears throat> yeah, that's predominantly kind of a yellow yellowish tone as well. Mm-hmm. But those are kind of your your tones that you're going to see as mm-hmm. in the in them. All right. I will say. Um, I don't have a cat, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but, you know, it, it's like 
you talk to people all the time and the same, I, the same thing with my tie Ridgebacks. Everyone said, Oh my gosh, is this dog going to be okay with my cat? And they got the dog home and the dog was fine with their cat. Um, it, it's all I, I think largely about the early socialization mm-hmm. and showing the dog that that cat is part of the family. Mm-hmm. Um, now I do have parrots um, and they are, you know, they're in a big Avery rate, you know, right going in and out of the door where they go out and they have never, you know, never really, I don't think I've really had to crack them. Um, I did have my Siberian Husky give a pretty good stock stare that, um, you know, I had to, you know, tell her no. Um, but I haven't really had too much, too many problems with that. But outside, you know, outside, and if it's not part of your family mm-hmm. and you've got, you know, rabbits in your yard running free, you know, chickens, you're going to need to be careful because they are a hunting dog. They have, they have those instincts. We feed raw. Okay. So we're pretty proud of it. Yeah. We feed, we feed, everyone gets fed raw, um, organ meat The we do the, the it's called the barf diet, biologically appropriate species, something, something like that. Anyways, <laughs> you can look it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, muscle meat and the 70% muscle peat meat, 10% edible bone, organ meat, uh, 10% veggies. And we add in things every once in a while, like chicken feet, um, kaffir, you know, think different things to, you know, help their immune system. I'm very, very passionate about dog health. And, and I know with the neat thing with the Fuquak Ridgeback is their lifespan is, um, supposedly quite good. Um, they, you know, they always say that coming from a country that they, these dogs get, you know, this is a, not a wealthy country, you know, Vietnam, especially after the war. And, and, you know, these dogs don't get a lot of veterinary care at all. And despite that, they they live to like 12 to 16 years, up to 16 years. Quite often they'll live that long. So um, they are a really healthy breed, but I like to kind of kickstart them with that raw diet. Mm-hmm. And all of our puppies start on a raw diet. Every dog we raise we put on raw and if the family wants to continue that that's fine if they don't you know not everyone can do raw so or or is comfortable doing raw because it's a little bit you know it's meat right Right. you know if you're a vegetarian it looks kind of like intimidating (laughs) yeah no doubt Um, yeah and so you you're planning on having your first litter uh, next year or yeah, this this winter actually oh. in a in a couple days we'll be having our first litter. Oh my! That... Yeah, yeah. So very exciting. Yeah, that is very cool. Well, first of all, I don't speak Vietnam, but the the, the family who gave them to me, um, well, I bought them from them. Um, they have stayed friends Mm -hmm. and they have been just amazing in sharing information. Um, they really, really love this breed. Um, I was kind of under a contract to breed these dogs and, and they wanted me to breed them and bring them in. Basically they, they loved the dogs very, very much, but they were, um, they were really, they they were having a child at the same time Mm -hmm. and it was just, it was just too much with everything going on. And, and, you know, and they, you know, they wanted to find someone. And so they, they found, you know, they found me and it kind of was amazing. It actually came at a really crazy time though, because I was selling a litter of Thai Ridgeback puppies and my dad says, Oh, there, there's a website called Kijiji in Canada uh-huh. and they advertise dogs. And my dad had said, Oh, there's another kind of Ridgeback on, um, on Kijiji. And I go, what? Um, and then I go, um, really? And then it ends up being, uh, go, oh, Rhodesian, Rhodesian, right? And my dad goes, no, no, another kind of, go. well, there's no way there's the Vietnamese rich back because they are like that rare. And he goes, I don't know what it was. And I look online and I'm just shocked. And so I had to go see these dogs and I was amazed that there was this really awesome breeding pair. Um, and they had brought them into, into Canada with the intention of breeding. So when they found me, they kind of saw it as this is a great opportunity where, you know, they knew the dogs were going to come. They came out to the place. They saw the dogs were going to have a great home here. And they, they really liked me. And, and they, they're they very passionate about the breed. Um, they would like a puppy um, later on when things, you know, when they're ready for it. And, um, you know, they, they, 
they have a real passion for this dog that you know is from their homeland Mm -hmm. um he shares lots and lots of information with me about the breed and um you know and 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 information on them about you know stuff you can't find online you know Right. right right like you don't see it because it's in vietnamese like so much of it is in vietnamese so it's pretty cool you know like i learned like i didn't know that they that they go out hunting on their own that the people let them out and they go out and get their own meat you know like that this happens mm-hmm. because they don't always have the money for the food out there so the dog has all these instincts and extraordinary abilities like one of the neatest things about this breed is they can they can climb trees. Um, they can. I have seen my male jump eight feet across the ground. Wow. Like taking a couple steps and like I've had company over and he's just like, I have never seen a dog ever do that in my life. Like mm-hmm. just like fly across the ground, not even at a, at a big run, just. And it's it's incredible. Like they're they're they have these incredible abilities and, and they can swim very well. They have webbed feet. They can catch fish in Vietnam. Like they are, they are the ultimate little dog, but they're, they're not, they want, they want to bond with you. They, you know, they're, like I said, they're a little bit like a little, they're a little bit in between the Mm -hmm. domesticated dog and the wild dog, but they want to bond, Mm -hmm. you know, they want to connect to you. And, um, Anyway, so I got off topic there. No, no, that's great. But they have incredible ability to love you. And, 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 you know, once you get them socialized, they like meeting people. They're friendly and, they, you know, but they can be a little more feral. So you need to work with them and train them on that. Right. How do they, uh, how do they act in the house compared to some of your other domesticated type uh, breeds? Um, they're, they're fairly, fairly active, um, but not, you know, not too much. Um, I mean, it, it, it all depends. Like if you don't give them any exercise and they're going to be busy, but I find them, I don't find them too bad at all. I find them, I find them a little bit easier in a sense. Um, once you get past those puppy chew stages, I find them very trainable. You know, you teach them not to chew this, not to chew that, and they kind of start to get it. They will kind of lay down and relax and settle. So they're not, you know, super crazy in the home. And what's really nice about them is they're, they're quiet breeds. Mm-hmm. Typically, typically they're a lot quieter than they're nice to live with. Like I love my German shepherd and he's a very good boy. Um, but, you know, years of having German shepherds in for board and train, they're, they're, they can be quite yappy. <laughs> right. You know, you got to train them. You got to train that out of them to be to be quiet in a home. And, you know, barking at things versus the Fuquak and the Thai Ridgeback are both often kind of a quieter, a little more mellow to live with. They have a a nice energy. Mm-hmm. Well, I used to call myself a balanced dog trainer. Mm-hmm. Um basically I said, okay, well, I'm, you know, in between this and I'm in between that. Then I kind of started to phrase myself that way. I started to pay more and more attention to body language. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think, wait, 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 this is so much more about communication. So now I call myself a communication based trainer where I study communication. I've studied a lot of dog behavior. I originally went to a lot of dog training workshops Mm -hmm. to immerse myself in with all those reputable dog trainers, Chad Mackin, Tyler Muto, um, Brian Agnew, Sherry Lucas, um, you know, all those, those, you know, good, um, Heather Beck, you know, those, all those ones and, and learned so much from them. And then I kind of started to learn a little bit more from the dogs themselves, you know, the dogs seeing and raising litters was something that I wanted to do as well as part of my dog Mm -hmm. training journey to see, you know, What's, what am I missing here that, that I could be learning in, you know, from this, having this more raw and primal experience? You know, I find myself talking to clients a little bit differently, you know, and, and, and connecting them more to, you know, this is, this is, this is the way they're raised. The challenge is, is to um, be, bring the training to the people 
in such a manner that is something that is safe Mm -hmm. and something that they will do. You know what I mean? Like, um, not to give them, you know, you know, to give them, to give them that empowerment, you know, but at the same time, you know, dogs can be a little bit raw sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And that one of the things sometimes you see when you read litters is, you know, one of the things I realize is you've got these great, really friendly social dogs and they're great dogs. And you realize that when you have litters longer, puppies that stay a little bit longer then you know, usually when a breeder, they often have the dogs gone by eight weeks old. Right. So you don't see a lot of what I call the wolf, mm-hmm. <laughs> the wolf and the pack instincts coming out because the dogs are too young. Right. So you see all these, you know, the temperaments come out and you see, you see that they're a little more wolf than, than you actually, than we actually thought, Yeah, you know, and, and then, I, and it shocks me because sometimes I'm like, wow, when you change the environment of the dog, when you, we, we tend to select dogs and we put them in environments where we don't see how primal they can be, how, how they are a little more wolf than I thought where, you know, I used to study the wolves at the wolf center and I thought there was a big, huge divide between dogs and wolves. And then when I had litters, as they went later on, you start to see more sibling conflicts arise. Um, you start to see more, more instincts coming out, you know, in, 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 in really looking for that leadership and, and testing each other for strength and stuff like that. And these are really nice social puppies. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, you know, it's just a different, but like I said, bringing things to people, connecting them back to that, but in a manner that is humane and safe and um, something that works for them as well, you know? Mm, exactly. It's always giving people the right techniques, you know? That, um, but I always say it's okay to say no, you know? It's okay to tell your dog no. If your dog is, you know, jumping all over you, it's okay for you to say no too, you know? Right. We don't really have a kennel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, we have, um, I don't really have a kennel. I have uh, a very huge home, mm-hmm. uh, an old, old farmhouse, uh, older than Canada, actually. Wow. And um, yeah, very old. And basically we have it set up in, in kind of different areas where, you know, dogs kind of will live in pairs. Um, and they're all a part of the family. They all get to come out and go for walks and play and socialize and chill out in the home. Um, now, like, I mean, in the warmer months, we'll have, we have like, you know, dogs that are like, I have intact animals as well. And some dogs that, you know, they're all okay when I'm there is what I'll say. Right. Right. They all know how to mind their manners when I'm there, but it would be too risky um, say, for example, to have my German Shepherd and my Thai Ridgeback floating around the house right. together all the time, you know, my males. Uh, so they mind their manners very well when I'm there, but they, you know, they're rotated out and, and you know, we try to let them have, you know, they'll go out and uh, I've divided my yard up into, I've got a huge yard and I've divided it up into, you know, three different sort of areas in one area I'm trying to go back into the forest a little bit so they can all kind of play and and interact with you know if I'm not watching them they can go and hang out like I've got this little puppy pack and like my my fuquak pack um sorry my my two fuquaks get along very well with my Siberian huskies oh, okay um the the mindset like I said the mindset on the breeds is similar it's it's a pack mind it's uh-huh. it's they understand things don't escalate when they're on their own they don't escalate to fights You know, Mm -hmm. Um, they seem to kind of understand, Okay, well, oh, you said that was my my stick, you know, and you'll see them. Oh, okay, well, that's your stick. I understand you've said no. So they all get along very well. So they'll all kind of chill out together. You know, we kind of put those dogs together and they'll go and hang out for a while and hang out with their buddies and then, you know, sort of thing. And then, you know, trips to town and stuff like that. Um, you know, trips to pet stores, socialization experiences, hikes, um, you know, backpacking. Um, they're all involved in my dog training business to a degree. You know, they all get to be immersed and and a part of it and they all help rehabilitate dogs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them are, are demo dogs. Like most of my dogs are, can come into my dog training obedience program. Um, but I kind of, I kind of put them in situations where they, where they're successful and where they feel, 
you know, like if I've got a dog, like that doesn't really like dealing with like annoying puppies, you know, then I won't bring it into dog class, you know, and you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll maybe bring it in on graduation night, you know, sort of thing, show it off. But, right. but everybody has a, everybody has a role and everybody has kind of a function within the, within our center and a job and, and uh, we just like them to be a part of things and a part of the family. I specialize in dog behavior. Okay. So probably I'm most known for dog reactivity. I'm very, very solid on that. I studied a lot on that. And it's really ultimately my passion is getting dogs to, to work together as a team, um, cooperation sort of thing. So we do a lot of, you know, board and trains where people bring dogs to me that are not good with other dogs Mm -hmm. and I train them to be more social we use the dogs at my center to help out with them we use the dogs in the public and we get really great results that's awesome and then we coach the family you know so the family can kind of follow through and and uh obedience I do an uh, an unlimited beginner level program and uh like I said it's really cool because most of my dogs are demo dogs and they can kind of can kind of come in and, and, and do that role as well. What are some of the really uh, uh, tough breeds to deal with as far as dog reactivity? Uh, I don't really find a tough breed. I know it's funny. Another trainer in the area will tell me German shepherds uh-huh. are so challenging. She's like, oh, German shepherds are the, and I'm like, a German shepherd's a piece of cake? Really? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. to me, a German shepherd, a reactive German shepherd. Um, I don't struggle with reactivity a whole lot. Um, it tends to be something I do get really good results with. Um, what I would say would be a little bit more, I think every dog has the ability to walk nicely by another dog, mm-hmm. um, mind its manners, even if it's not, like, quote unquote, what I, quote unquote, a pack dog. Mm-hmm. So what I would say more, it's not necessarily a breed thing, but a personality thing. Yeah. So yes, of course, it's going to occur more in guardian breeds, more in, in dogs, you know, than hounds, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, but it can occur, it can occur in any breed where there's, you know, the mind of the dog, I came kind of, um, to grips with like, kind of like, um, not grips, but kind of an understanding of this when I, I had my female tie ridge back and I would see that, you know, that she wasn't, um, she wasn't socialized with other dogs when I got her with other breeds. So she was a little bit like, Whoa, ah, ah, you know, like just like reactive. And I got that away from her and she, she does really, really well. Now she, you know, she, she listens well and she understands what I want. Um, but her mind is not pack oriented, Mm -hmm. you know? So she, for example, she doesn't want to have like a bunch of puppies jumping all over her back, you know, Mm -hmm. like learning their social cues from her. So that's just something that, you know, I don't put her in that sort of job, you know, that's just not who she is. So I think once you understand the this the actual social nature and the pack nature of a breed or an individual right Mm -hmm. it might not be a breed thing it might be more of an individual thing where you know like the like the fuquak ridgeback dog like i said um i think they have a really nice um ability to pack in with other dogs Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you set things up for success, but I think that that's, that's one of their really big traits is that they, I think they're quite happy to live with other dogs. And I think, you know, a lady called me the other day about, she had a American bulldog and a King Corso that were fighting, you know, and, um, you know, that's, and they were, one was intact, one wasn't, but, um, you know, those are two power breeds, you know, and, and they can get into it pretty good you know, two males and, um, you know, is, is, and I had to tell her, I said, this might be a situation where you have to be on trainer mode with these two dogs, mm-hmm. you know, that, um, you know, you can work them together, but it's going to be a lot of work just from everything she told me, you know? Well, sometimes too, I think sometimes the, the interesting thing about breeds is it's not the breed, but it's the breeding. Right. It's the, 
Right. It's what the, and Chad Mackin said that, and I thought that is so true, uh-huh. because I have met so many Cane Corsos who have been so laid back, right, and so chilled out, and like Labradorish, and I've met German Shepherds now in my area, I've met several of them that are very Labradorish, and they're not protective at all, and they're very chill, they're very like goofy, goofy, uh-huh. goofy dogs, um, so it's all in kind of what you're breeding into that breed. Um, I mean, but I think there's a big movement right now. And as a dog trainer, I was so trained to not look at breed, right. you know, that breed didn't matter. And, oh, and it's all the way how you socialize. And then when I started breeding dogs, I started and getting all kinds of different breeds. I started thinking, wait, wait, breed is important, mm-hmm. you know? If, if, if for the last 8,000 years, the Kangal dog has been watching out for predators, you know, why, why are we looking at that so differently than, mm-hmm. you know, than say a Mastiff breed who has been doing it quite recently as well, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, it, it's not as, as ingrained those instincts in the dog, but understanding the instincts in your dog and what you might see come up in your, in your dog breed, you know, yeah. knowing okay, I'm prepared to deal with this um, and knowing, you know, this is what can happen sort of thing. And, and um, But, I mean, they're all, all breeds of dogs are amazing, really, right? Like, I love them all when it comes down to it. Yeah. I have my certain ones that I really like, but, yeah. So you, you, you brought it up. I'm I, I fascinated by this breed, too, the Kangol. Tell me about how you yeah. got, got into that. Well, um, <laughs> I originally, like, I originally got into the Kangol, and I'll tell you, when I got a, <laughs> I remember posting on a dog training forum that I was looking for a Kangol, and I was hoping to work with dog reactivity and go hiking with the dog. And I remember I just got, like, blasted by the by dog trainers, like, who the hell is this girl? You know, what she's saying? You know, what's wrong with her, you know? Um <laughs> Now, I, I, I do do those things with my dog, um, but I'm smart about it, uh-huh. you know? I also have a really great-hearted Kangol that, you know, who is not looking for trouble, um, but I don't do stupid things with her, uh-huh. you know? Like, I don't, you know, I work her with dog reactivity, uh-huh. um, but I don't work her with anything big and powerful lunging for my pack, right. you know? I work her with something that she sees it. And she knows that I have control over that dog, you know, and she's not worried. Right. So, um, I got into it, like I was saying earlier about that great Dane that I fell in love with. And I thought this Dane was so cool. It was a, it was a Euro Dane. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, at the end of the day, I looked at it and I thought, oh, I kind of want one. But then I was like, oh, the heart break breed five or six years. And, and the people that gave them to me that all the medication this eight month, eight month old dog was on mm-hmm. to prevent illnesses and bloats and all that and I thought no way like I just so I was looking for a giant breed dog originally like I'm a, I'm a pretty athletic I'm a runner mm-hmm. I did a lot of competing and um in high school and at records and all that and and I was looking for a giant breed dog that could run and had good endurance and it just didn't exist and then I was like Anatolian Shepherd mm-hmm. ah and I looked in that, and then I was like, then I found the king. I was like, oh, wow. And then I was just, like, researching more and more. And I was like, this seems like a really interesting dog. And I just kind of, I was a little, I was scared. I was very scared at first to get the breed because, you know, you hear all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. All this negative feedback. And then, basically, I got a really great Kangol. Uh, I socialized her right away, and she's been amazing. You know, like, they're they're really, they're really amazing dogs, you know, if you, and they're not, they're not vicious killer dogs that are out to, I mean, the way some of those dog trainers kind of, I guess some of them had worked with the worst Kangles, but the way they kind of cast a picture of them was that these were some psychotic livestock guardian dogs who were looking to respond to anything we perceived as a threat, like anything. And what I find is I have a very laid back dog. That's like, eh, I'm not worried. Right. That's all right. And, and I've seen her and there is, you know, you know, not every Kangol's like that, but they have that 
by shepherd in them. So like a kind of a variation of the Turkish shepherd dog. It's uh it's not a breed of dog, but it's a type of dog that they they add into their lines often and it's uh it's a late more laid back dog. It kind of thinks about things a little bit and so I've got a pretty laid back I mean she's she's got instincts but she's a great dog. And what's the difference between the Anatolian and the Kangal? Um it's a huge debate and it's a huge argument mm-hmm. with piles of people into the Tur- the Turkish shepherd dogs are largely are largely the same actually um the only real difference in my opinion is that the Anatolian shepherd came from Anatolia mm-hmm. and the and the Kangal dog came from Sifis Turkey mm-hmm. so in different areas of Turkey they were bred and they look different <clears throat> So there's a difference in appearance mm-hmm. in how those dogs look. So um, the Kangal is stronger, more solid, more square head, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the Anatolian is um, a leaner dog, a little bit not as boxy of a head. I like the Anatolian too, but I really like that Kangal. I really like that structure on that Kangal. And they've still got like... Kangal has that tremendous athletic ability, and a lot of people don't realize that, that they are a sighthound mastiff, and they have excellent running ability. They can, they, they believe that the, it was the Turkish Tazi, which is a Turkish greyhound that can run forever, mm-hmm. very fast and, and forever. It's, uh, it's not like the English greyhound, and that you know goes a short distance so the kangle dog if they're in good shape can can run really good you know and they got good endurance so you know Mm -hmm. great dogs i love them i love i love all these breeds i truly am so passionate about them what uh what breeds of dogs that are you really interested in but you've never had any first-hand experience with uh well, this this will kind of provoke controversy, but um, the Czechoslovakian wolf dog was a dog I would love to own one day. Mm-hmm. Um, now, before people jump on that, it is not a wolf dog in the classical sense, as in this dog has been living with humans for over 60 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it has been domesticated enough to live in a home. And it's something like a quarter wolf, but they're not, um, they're, they're many, many generations removed from the wolf. So they're not, um, like I said, they're not, they don't tend to have those problems that hybrids do where, you know, one day the wolf grows up and you go on the couch and the wolf, you know, goes after you because it wants to assert that it's the elf of the pack. They're not really, they're not, don't have those same hardwired instincts that the wolf do i guess they get bred out a bit but they're still they're still wolfy um but where i live they're they're banned right there is no and that's one of the thing that gets me is you can have a pit bull they're trying to bring the pit bull back right Mm -hmm. which i have no problem with but it's like can we bring the czech wolf dog too because this dog is all over europe Mm -hmm. like it's all over dog shows all over europe in europe you can I've seen people walking them in malls and cafes, you know, and you can't, you can't even have one in Ontario because you can't have any dog with any wolf content. It's, mm-hmm. it's illegal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, it's considered wildlife. They consider it full fledged wildlife. Now, yeah. you, do you, do you think you'll import any more dogs or? Well, I'm hoping depending on the, the size of our litter, uh-huh. um, I'm hoping that we have some quality to hold back in, in, we can hold back with, you know, and put them into homes or whatever. And, and I'm hoping we can import, um, more, Mm -hmm. um, a male and expand our line. As I said, these dogs are, are until you own one, until you live with one for a little bit, they're exceptional. Like they have, um, they have something about them. Mm -hmm. They have something about them. They're, um, 
they're just they're just remarkable their athletic abilities their personalities they're fun and you know the way they greet you and the way they greet the other dogs in the pack it's like african wild dogs where they stand up on and that's what i love about them because they're kind of they're domesticated but they're like kind of feral too with they'll, they'll stand up on their hind legs and they'll just mouth each other and like just like the african wild dogs like just shaky, like just shake, like um, greeting, like not shaking each other, but just total celebration. Um, and and so I, I mean, I'm hoping that we'll have uh, a longer line of these dogs um, that will have more. Where we're, we have quite a bit of interest in our in our litter right now, so we're looking for some really great and awesome people that that are passionate about these type of breeds, and you know want to maybe put them in the in the um in agility ring or go hunting with them or do lure coursing with Mm -hmm. them something that they can enjoy and have fun with and Mm -hmm. um you know we're hoping to make a demand for them here in in that people want them more so and uh and then we'll go from there because i i I mean i'm very passionate about them so we'll see how things go but it looks like it looks like things are looking pretty good right now you know because when i got them they were not socialized you know, mm-hmm. they were, they were really feral. They were really feral. So, I mean, just, just not, you know, and some people that they don't have, you know, they have the, their breeding camps on Vietnam, but they're, they're not, it's not really a puppy mill, you right. know, it's, um, but they're, they don't always have the same time to put, you know, here in the Western world, we often have more money more resources Mm -hmm. and more ability to kind of put more time into socializing our dogs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes out there they're just struggling to kind of get by and, and, you know, they're having to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. So the dogs don't always get that social experience as puppies that they, that they miss that. So that's, what's really cool is that this litter, we raised them with early neurological stimulation so I did that with my tie Ridgebacks, and it was amazing how well they came out. They came out, um, I would say about 80% of them came out like very Labradorish. And the people tell me today that they're still super sweet to people on the street. Um, now, the primitive nature is more like, um, I need to build trust with you, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so not aggression, just go a little slower with me. That's the, I personally prefer the primitive nature a little bit. I think it's, I, I like to tame it. I like to bring out, you know, and, and it, what was amazing with my Congo was, you know, when I got him, he was so, you know, like it took me about 40 minutes to be able to lay a finger on him mm-hmm. and no aggression, no aggression at all. Just like, just totally like feral and getting a leash on him. And then, I did some sort of, sounds funny, but there was a famous uh, bird whisperer. Um, He died. His name was uh, Ken Globus. And he died, um, I don't know, but he had some amazing secrets for taming feral, like not feral, but parrots that you couldn't handle. And he could take a big macaw out of a cage that was biting and birds that had, and it was all fear-based, right? And he, he, um, anyways... I, I studied him and some of the techniques that he did, and I've got some really great desensitization exercises that I did that it was amazing that I was really kind of got these dogs at the wrong timing, to be honest with you. Um, my timing was a bit off. I mean, I had just gotten my Huskies, and I would have ideally liked to space my dogs out a bit better um, when I get them so I can put a little more time in them, but that's kind of the way it worked out. But it was amazing that he just blew me away when I, you know, when I took him into public, Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that it was, it amazed me that, that he was, you know, you know, like the first time I took him into public, the people were able to pet him. Like I was just blown away. So he just got a lot of, he got a lot of trust with me. And and I guess my training background really helped to kind of teach him trust. And I mean, he's, amazing now like he's just a great dog and and i'm i'm excited for people to have these dogs and to see how you know that they are 
you know, they're different and, and they're, there's something really, truly special about them. And, and, um, I, I want to find people that are passionate about that primitive nature and the training aspect and, and not just into the look of the dog, you know, mm-hmm. like people that are drawn to that. You see that sometimes with the tie ridge back people where they want, they want a certain coat color and they want a certain look. And that's sometimes the only issue I have with the show dog world is that it's a lot of focus in on the mind of a dog or sorry, on the body of the dog and not enough on the mind. Right. You know, and I think you're missing these dogs. You're not learning them and you're not really knowing them. If you don't really care about that, that nature that they have, that is different and special. And, you know, it's something that we, we, I think we need to, you know, we need to bring, it's just a world where we're trying to create humans to fit into all the animals have to fit perfectly into the human world, you know? Right? Yeah. No. And yeah. trying to create a breed, bringing these breeds from Vietnam where they don't do that the same. Like, they don't, they let the dog be, you know? And the dog still has its hunting instincts and it still has its climbing instincts and still has its jumping. And, I mean, you got to have secure fencing. <laughs> I will tell you that. So... I think, you know, the Fukuok Ridgeback, yes, they. I think they could be an apartment dog or a townhome dog in the right home with the right person, with a person that likes to do stuff with their dog, that likes to be active. But if you've got loose fencing and you're, I mean, every dog's different. Maybe the dog won't go over the fence, you know, but if you've got loose fencing and you're going to, you know, not do anything with your dogs... You know, it just depends. I mean, when you get a couple of them together, that's more when they want to run too, right? When they want to go. But but they're a hunting breed, and it is important to understand that, you know, that um, that they have instincts, you know. and uh, But your dog should, be, you know, you should just know the instincts of your dog and what you need to do to create that right environment. But, but don't be afraid of it, you know. Definitely. And that, yeah. If that's... you're afraid of it, then don't get the dog. Right. Hey, and thanks for your time, and and um, I look forward to seeing your puppies, and yeah, and keep me posted. And thank you. I have a couple of groups and pages and stuff that I that I have, and anything that you want me to share, I can share. And um, sure, I'll great. Well, thank you very much, Sean, thank and you. I look forward to to hearing this, and I appreciate you taking the time to interview me, and that was great. Yeah, and maybe uh, in the near future we'll we'll do it again. Yes, that would be fun. All right. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.